And so today we're going to be expanding on some of the materials we covered last time with uh, networks. And uh, during our previous uh, class, we had gone through uh, and investigated a series of ways that different network types uh, systematically affect um, structure of a network and the dynamics of the network, the way in which uh, contagion processes like infection spread across that network. And, and one of the things we noted was that uh, some of these network types um, yield, uh, give rise to emergent patterns in terms of spread of contagion, which are quite distinctive from what we would see um, with a random mixing uh, assumption um, that's typically in place for aggregate system dynamics models, where we assume that any susceptible can contact any infective in the population and where to assess the risk to that susceptible, um, the force of infection, this chance per unit time that they'll get infected, it, it is, is determined within these sort of models by the fraction of the population with whom they're mixing um, that is infective. Um, and it's a, it's a fairly uh, blunt uh, sort of assessment of their risk because we know that people are often situated and uh, they're situated in certain physical locations, uh, geographic locations, and indeed in terms of contacts from others that are typically structured. We, we don't uh, mix with equal probability with everyone in our uh, city of residence. Rather, we, we have disproportionate mixing with, with certain individuals. And last time we saw that a variety of network types induce, um, therefore, different uh, behavior over time in terms of how infection spreads. Um, amongst other things, there's locality effects whereby it, the infection can kind of get bottled up in a certain area. The classic example of that was ring lattice. Um, but we also saw that with, with 2D locality where you have these kind of waves of spread. And if you can interrupt that wave of spread in some sort of way, if you can put your efforts into just kind of the frontier of where that prairie fire is spreading, um, you may be able to stop it uh, with much greater uh, much, much greater effectiveness and much less, much fewer resources than if you had to deal with the whole area that uh, it has been through. Um, and uh, there's a lot of conditions like that where all the actions at you know certain places right now, and if we could focus our efforts disproportionately there, we may be able to secure advantages. An example that we've examined in our in our modeling, um, and uh, which may yet prove quite uh, helpful within our province more generally is outbreak response immunization, where you know, there's an outbreak occurring and you, in a targeted way, perhaps in a ring sort of way or a way that, um, that focuses on a geographic area, you focus a lot of vaccination resources there to shortchange the ability for it to spread. Um, there's many things that can be said about that, but the basic idea is that we, um, have in many cases this tremendous amount of locality. And we saw several network types which uh, captured that. Today, we're gonna build on one of the network types that we, we, we mentioned in passing last time, and that is the scale-free network. Scale-free networks um, uh, carry a great deal of uh, theoretic and practical interest. Um, and, uh, they serve as useful points of reference and understanding otherwise puzzling phenomena, like why certain contagions, say certain infections, stay rooted in a network, even though you would think based on the average number of connections each person has, that it would never survive, it would never live on. The basic reproductive number would be less than one, and you would think it would die out, but it doesn't. Um, and this was noted back in the 80s for things like sexual transmitted infections. Um, but it's been a phenomenon seen um, in diverse areas. And it turns out this carries over, like many of these principles, to many other spheres as well. Um, one, one might pause it in the area of, of um, some of the issues I spoke about at the beginning 
of last, last class. Uh, issues having to do with victimization and bullying and, and bigotry and, and, um, and otherizing and microaggressions, et cetera. But it, it also carries over to, to other spheres entirely. Computer networks, it turns out, are characterized often by scale-free networks in the large. Um, we have scale-free networks that emerge in transaction networks between companies, uh, things like supply chains or financial transactions. Um, we have scale-free networks emerge in the structure of our software programs. Um, so scale-free networks are these uh, phenomena that, that recur again and again and again. And there's a reason for that. And the reason reflects the underlying processes by which they, they come about, uh, that give rise to them. Um, and it's particularly uh, processes associated with preferential attachment um, uh, by which certain, um, um, certain uh, individuals or companies or computers um, uh, who, who have a lot of connections already uh, are added connections. And it turns out there's a dimensional structure by which um, that can lead to these sort of uh, scale-free networks pop out as well, um, in which um, the, the very dimensions that characterize a problem, the fact that this is per unit time and that's people per, you know, per, um, per vaccine and, and this other thing is, um, is characterized as um, uh, area. Um, it turns out once you understand that deeply, um, that often there are these scaling laws that come out of it that exhibit power law scaling. So, so these uh, and power law scaling is is a kind of hallmark of of scale free networks. So we're going to see um, these characteristics of scale ne networks, bearing in mind that our motivating examples, as in many areas of this course, will be in in this health sphere, particularly this reference point of infectious disease spread, which is so uh, apt and timely right now. But bear in mind that these principles will carry over to many different spheres. So with that, with that preamble, I'm gonna switch over to, uh, to my slides. And specifically, um, we're going to uh, be examining two big aspects of scale-free networks. Um, uh, one of them is, is understanding this power law scaling relationship, which on a log log graph gives rise to straight lines. Um, it's associated with cases where we have, uh, most people having very, very few connections. These are connections on here on the, on the axes, but um, some individuals having very, very high numbers, 100, uh, 100 sexual partners per year, 70, uh, 30, uh, et cetera. And uh, yet most people having comparatively few. Um, this, this sort of situation where we have tremendous heterogeneity, heterogeneity that extends over orders of magnitude, um, where there's this heavy tail where some non-trivial fraction of people has a vastly larger um, set of characteristics. Maybe it's um, uh, connections in a computer network. Maybe it's, um, uh, disproportionate amount of mixing day-to-day uh, -day, uh, in terms of the number of people they see in their day-to-day -day transactions, or in this case, uh, sexual partners. Um, there's this disproportionate uh, uh, heterogeneity. So we're going to look at um, how that induces um, certain patterns characterized by power law scaling. Um, there's this statistical relationship between the probability of having K partners and having, let's say, 2K partners. Um, uh, having 2K partners is one quarter as likely as having K partners, regardless of what the value of K is. If you're going from two to four, um, having four, four partners might be four times less likely than, than two. Um, but if you go from uh, 200 to 400, uh, having 400 is also four times likely than 200. So we'll, we'll see that. Uh, we'll see this power law scaling and how it gives rise to on a log log plot, this sort of, um, um, this sort of uh, linear 
uh, feature. We will also uh, be looking at uh, the, the ways in which this affects infection spread. And what we'll see is that these sort of networks um, massively accelerate infection spread. And particularly, it's not just the average number of connections that drives that infection spread, it's, it's variability in those connections. Um, and we'll see that it can, that can raise uh, for any given infection, if you have this sort of a sort of scale-free network, um, the uh, the survival of that infection become possible, where otherwise it would die out due to uh, an effective reproductive number uh, less than one, or at the beginning a, a basic reproductive number less than one. So there's many conditions in life in which we see this kind of disproportionate heterogeneity or disparities. You know, you've heard a lot of talk about the 1%, for example, uh, who own a disproportionate fraction of, of Canada's resources or even more so in the US. Uh, there's a disproportionate heterogeneity uh, seen in, in people's uh, behavior, but also in the, uh, the revenues seen by companies and the connectedness of networks, et cetera. Um, and we'll see uh, why this can have a disproportionate impact on dynamics in turn. Okay, um, now I'd like to uh, focus us on this issue of contagion, this issue of, um, of, of the spread of uh, some, some phenomenon um, uh, over time across uh, a network. And this could be pathogen, it could be a, a bug, uh, it could be uh, a computer virus, uh, it could be a rumor, it could be a conspiracy theory. Um, we could have uh, any number of, of different instantiations that, that all observe this basic feature of having susceptibles who have not yet encountered it, infectives who ha have encountered it and are actively promoting it, and people have encountered it and, and are now beyond it. And if they see it again, it's, it's not something that they're gonna react to. That carries over for infection as well as these other processes. And in this context, across these areas. Um, if you stop and think about uh, it, there's a really disproportionate impact um, that, that can be exerted by heterogeneity, differences, disparities in the contact rate or the number of partners for any given unit time, for example, uh, within, within circulating individuals. And if we're dealing with sexual partners, for example, um, someone with a high number of partners is both more likely to be infected by somebody. After all, they've lots of people with whom they're interacting and they can get infected by any one of them. But that person with a high number of partners is not only more likely to be on the receiving end of infection, they're more likely to pass it on to a different person, right? Um, more likely to, uh, to disseminate it very effectively, um, unfortunately effectively, um, regrettably effectively. Uh, and uh, what, this, uh, what this lends credence to is the idea we may see very different infection rates in high contact individuals. They're magnets for infection and they may exert really high influence on other people's in terms of spreading the infection. It could be a super spreader. And you may have heard that, that term in the context of COVID-19 it was a term that came up for SARS uh, back in 2003. Um, and uh, it reflects the fact that certain uh, parties or, or settings maybe uh, have way disproportionate likelihood of spreading it. And with, with COVID-19, I've heard estimates, it's not like 20% of the people are responsible for 80% of the infections. And that's the kind of Pareto law you see coming out of this. Now, one of the practical implications of this is that we can focus our efforts in protecting and preventing um, infection by high contact people, or maybe discovering that infection more quickly. So if there's certain individuals who have very high rates of contact, maybe they need to get tested more frequently. Uh, or maybe they have to engage especially uh, well-monitored uh, use of, of things such as uh, 
of masks and social distancing. So we're going to be looking at, at two broad uh, questions. What sort of networks account for the sort of patterns seen in these figures? Um, these, these patterns that are linear features um, uh, within, within studies and, um, and, and across areas. And secondly, um, how do they affect the dynamics and how do we characterize that using dynamic modeling? And, and we're gonna in fact go back to, to ODE models uh, to examine how it would affect our modeling of that. So scale-free networks um, were characterized uh, about 20 years ago in, a, in an incredibly influential paper uh, by Barabasi and, and Albert and, and uh, Zhang um, which uh, noted these networks where there's most nodes have a relatively small number of connections. Um, if you look at these nodes around the periphery, they are uh, they are little connected. They have they have comparatively few connections, but there's a small number of nodes shown in red which have this really disproportionate number of connections. They're connected to a very large fraction in this case of all of all individuals in the network, or, or certainly a substantial fraction. Um, so here, most nodes have a smaller number of connections. Think most people have a smaller number of, of, of sexual partners. That's what we saw here. Um, but a small number of people have very, very large numbers. Um, and uh, we sometimes describe this as having a, a heavy tail, meaning on the sort of right-hand side here, the tail goes on and on and on and on. You can't see it quite as much here, although I think there's some very small numbers down here uh, for, for the um, out to like 50 or so. And, and what that's saying is, you know, it's not compactly supported. It's not really tight distribution. It keeps on extending out in a way that, um, that you know, you could have, um, the average person having two partners, one or two partners, but you might have some with 20, you might have some with 200. Um, and this heavy tail is much larger than what you would expect for something like if it were normally distributed uh, according to a, a normal distribution. Um, now, uh, it turns out that uh, this phenomenon uh, uh, has been studied quite a lot and one of the patterns that comes out of this is what is known as power law scaling, okay? And um, I want you to watch this carefully. Um, so the idea here is we're going to use consistent notation throughout this presentation. I, I, I spent a while overhauling it to make sure the notation is consistent. So for a given node, think given person, let's say, um, we're gonna denote their number of connections, connections say, per unit time, if, if you will, um, as K, okay? So maybe this is sexual partners over a year. Maybe it's um, a number of uh, people with whom they have contact uh, every six hours of the day. We'll see some data from Saskatchewan involving that. Um, uh, maybe it's um, the number of connections um, uh, with whom they share needles uh, every uh, you know, every year. Um, but we're going to, we're going to note their number of connections uh, as K for a given individual. And with power law scaling, the chance of a given individual having K partners is proportional to K, but to some negative exponent. And the negative reflects the fact that people, you know, if you compare the number of people with K partners with 2K, um, they're a lot. They're less likely to have two k than k. It's 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 going down. It's like one over k to the gamma, right? That's what k to the minus gamma is. So it's one over k to the gamma. And let's suppose k were. Let's suppose gamma were two. It'd be like one over k squared. Um, so it goes down with k. The further, the further k, uh, larger k is, the fraction of people having that many partners is is smaller. But it it doesn't go down exponentially. Exponential be e to the minus, you know, gamma k or something like that. This is k to the minus gamma. Okay. Um, 
So it's like one over k squared or one over k cubed. And in fact, for human sexual networks, uh, people have, have studied it and, and gamma seems to be between about two and 3.5. And you can actually see it uh, here, although this is um, uh, 1.6 here and, and this is on the upper side, 3.3. Uh, uh, now, um, a less shallow line, a gamma that's smaller will mean that it decays more slowly with growing K. So for one over K, that goes down with K as you raise K, but it goes down more slowly than one over K squared. Uh, one over K squared, by the time you get into, you know, K equals four, it's one over 16, right? Uh, whereas if it's one over K, it's one over four. Um, it's four times larger. Uh, so in other words, uh, if gamma is smaller, is, is, is like uh, one or two, this is gonna fall off very slowly as K increases. If gamma is really large, like five, it's gonna fall off really quickly. It's like one over K to the five, and that gets big real fast as, as K grows. Um, now, uh, we're going to see that um, these sort of networks apply in many different circumstances. And one of the key reasons that they occur, one of two, is that the, there's processes that give rise to them that are, are, uh, uh, exhibit these reinforcing feedbacks. So there's a generating process, a process by which this network is generated, okay? And um, there's a dynamics that gave rise to the network. Um, and uh, the particular dynamics that was identified by the original authors, um, Albert Young and Barabasi in 2000, was what's called preferential attachment. And the idea here is fairly simple. Imagine that you're starting out with just one node and, um, and you're successively, uh, excuse me, excuse me, I, I misspeak. You start out with N nodes, all of the nodes, but you start out with uh, zero connections and you add a connection in. And you're gonna add that connection uh, to the nodes uh, in a way that more highly makes it more likely that you'll give it to one that already has a uh, connection. So you'll, you'll weight the chance you give it to any node according to the number of connections that node already has. So initially everyone has zero connections and so you'll parcel it out um, you know, with, with equal probability. And, and basically it'll start building up that you reward the ones that have more connections with yet more connections. This is the adverse form of, of you know, the golden rule. Uh, this is the, you know, he who has the gold sets the rules. Um, uh, the one where uh, those who have get more um, and, uh, and accumulate more and more. They're disproportionately favored to gain, um, to gain advantage as, as time goes on. And if you think about this, this, this governs a lot of phenomena we see in the human world, unfortunately, the social world, uh, the political world, the economic world, um, and in the computer world. You know, as computer scientists, if you think about it, with page rank algorithms, the things that occur furthest up in Google page results are the ones that are most known, the ones that are most tweeted, most linked to, and they're pushed up even further in Google's page rank results. So the ones that have disproportionate visibility tend to become even more visible, more widely known, and often secure the resources to promote themselves even more, more fully. So this preferential attachment is a widespread feature and often a disconcertingly widespread feature in a lot of cases. And it's governed by a reinforcing feedback, right? Um, the more connections an individual has, the quicker one accumulates additional connections. And I've described the, the algorithm very roughly. Obviously, there's some special considerations given when you have zero, uh, zero connections up front, everyone has zero connections. But uh, the basic I, gist of it is given by this generating process and preferential attachment. Uh, 
And that tends to give rise to the scale-free structure. That tends to give rise to these sort of, of patterns because of this uh, phenomenon of power law scaling. It gives rise to a distribution and the number of connections of a given node that, that varies as k to the minus gamma. Um, and uh, this is called a, a power law relationship between number here of partners and uh, the, the frequency with which they are found within the population, okay? Um, so I mentioned you know, some examples here. Um, uh, they're legion, they're, they're ubiquitous. Um, we see them in a wide variety of spheres. There, there is another reason we see this. One is a generating process, but another is dimensional structure of, of a problem. And you can get this sort of phenomenon out of dimensional scaling considerations um, alone. And I don't know of anyone who's, who's really done a, a nice job elucidating if there's an underlying connection between those. This is sort of some data that we've run over the past um, 10 or so uh, previous years um, from successive smartphone studies uh, here in Saskatchewan, looking at contact patterns and mix, mixing patterns, geographic patterns, patterns of, of uh, interaction, and, and sometimes with reporting from people via, via short surveys called ecological momentary assessments. Um, uh, but these are from uh, students like you undergraduates, graduate students, staff um, in a variety of studies, uh, um, the Saskatchewan Health Ecology uh, data sets, the SHED studies. And what you'll find is exactly this sort of uh, phenomenon of sort of um, uh, these sort of uh, lines here within um, uh, the scaling relationships. Um, this is um, a sort of pattern that that comes out with contact frequency, contact duration, uh, and other cases. Now, this sort of power law scaling uh, is, uh, is something that is notable for exhibiting invariance to scale, okay? Um, so in other words, uh, when we see um, a uh, a pattern like this that is power law distributed, we, um, we sometimes scale it, say it is scale free. And I'd like to walk you through that. Why do we say it's scale invariant or, or scale free? Um, indeed, that name is lent to the very type of network structure. Um, well, one reason is, uh, the, the main reason is that, look, consider the distribution. I said the probability or frequency with which an individual has K connections goes as K to the minus gamma. Um, and it's K to the minus gamma times some constant, which is true for all K. It's just a scaling constant, so they all add up to one. Um, and uh, if we consider that, now consider, say, um, a situation where we compare that with the number of individuals who have alpha times k connections, maybe alpha is two. So we're consider we're comparing the the proportion of people in the population with k connections versus with two k connections, twice as many. So we're comparing, you know, a uh, number of people with ten versus twenty connections, or two versus four connections, or a hundred versus two hundred connections. Um, if if we uh, ask that, and we we ask, okay, p of k is this. What's P of 2K or P of alpha K more generally? Well, if, if you just plug it in, right? Plug in alpha K for, for K here, what you get out is something that, um, that looks like, like this. Um, I've, I've simply you know, shown the steps. It's just algebraic rearrangement. And this may not look very promising until you realize that alpha to the minus gamma is a, is a constant. It doesn't depend on K. So in other words, the, if we compare the ratio of, of people in the population who have 2K connections versus K, if we take P of alpha K over divided by P of K, um, what we're going to get is a constant, alpha to the minus gamma. Um, 
And what this is saying is that, look, this distribution looks the same at any scale. It doesn't matter if you're going from two people to four, or you're going four to eight, or you're going you know, 10 to 20, or you're going 100 to 200. Um, the, if you compare the relative fractions of people with the double number versus that number, 200 versus 100, it's the same for 200 and 100 as it is for two and, or for four and two. Um, so it looks the same at different scales. It just goes down by the same amount proportionally at whatever scale, however many people, however many connections we're talking about. It has this heavy tail that just keeps on going with the same law. And we can get this power law scaling for many sources. Um, and a key source um, is preferential attachment. Another one is dimensional structure. Um, so um, I realized uh, as I was finishing this up that um, this actually is not a proper log log graph. This should be log transform. So you could put this aside. Uh, it is interesting that we see some similar patterns here, but I'd have to reproduce this group uh, graph for um, a log log graph. These graphs are produced in a log log graph. So this is log. Um, uh, log transformed in this one. And we'll see why that is in just a minute. So I just wanted to correct that. Ah, here we go. I didn't have to go back. Okay. Um, and so if we consider this scaling relationship that, you know, basically as we increase K, the fraction of people who have K neighbors goes down, it's like one over K squared or one over K cubed, depending if, if, if gamma were two or three, for example. Um, uh, that's, um, it's worth reflecting the fact that if we were to plot that out, we'd see a curve that goes down sort of in a, in a, in a manner that, that drops quickly if we plotted K versus P of K. But ladies and gentlemen, but if we create what's called a log graph, uh, log log graph, excuse me, we plot on the X axis log K, and on the y-axis log, log of p of k or log of y, what we'll find is something that looks like this. Um, okay, so um, uh, we're we're using y to denote um, here. Okay, um, okay, this is uh, th this is what I want you to focus on here. Um, log of p of k. If we take the log of both sides, we get log of p of k in the left. And on the right-hand side, we get the log of this whole thing. And if you remember back to your high school logs, um, you'll, you'll recall that this, is, this can be, because it's the multiplication of two things, um, we could take the log of c, and we can multiply it by the log of k to the minus gamma. And the log of k to the minus gamma in turn is minus gamma times the log of k, right? Uh, just like the log of k squared is two, uh, two log k. So taking the log of this, this is what you get, okay? Um, uh, that, that's just this take, taking the log on both sides. And then we plot it. This is log k, and this is, uh, this is log p of k. So I'm, I'm gonna label this, I, I was a bad boy and I should have, um, I uh, should have labeled this uh, better. Oh my gosh, okay. Um, well, better better late than never and better Nate than lever. Um, okay, so here's log of P, of P of K and here's log of K. And you may wonder why is that a linear thing? Well, look, uh, as log of K goes up, um, it's just multiplied linearly times gamma. So if we go twice as far out on log K, um, uh, gamma, uh, it's going down by that same amount uh, gamma between them. So in other words, uh, as we go out here, it's, it's gamma times what's ever on this axis. And this is just some constant, right? This is when log of K is zero or K is one, we have log of P of X equals log C. So this is a constant and it leads to this linear feature just like this is this is like A minus B times X, right? So Y equals A minus B times X. 
uh, it produces this linear plot. We just have x being log k and, and y being log p of x. So, so this is a signature of the power law. It yields a straight line, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, it, it relates to the scale invariance um, uh, that, that no matter if we double K when K is two to four, or we double it from 100 to 200, we're always dividing P of K accordingly by some fixed factor. It's always a fixed factor. Um, and, you know, I provide some, some examples there. And, and so what looks to be a, a steep drop off, if you look at an unlogged transform graph, this is K itself, and this is P of K basically, um, when we log transform it, this is what we get. Um, this is log k. And notice it's as a log graph, it's going up. Here's 10, here's 100, here's 1,000. So going out by a fixed amount will multiply k um, by a fixed amount. Um, so uh, we have this sort of um, linear structure that is characterized by this power law. And if you look at different subgroups in a population, it's, it's not unusual to find uh, there's different scaling laws reflective of different behavior. Uh, and for sexual networks, this has been uh, noted a lot, uh, but you might see similar phenomenon across uh, many spheres for different sorts of network connections or different sorts of um, contact patterns. Uh, for someone who's a salesperson, you might see a lot more contacts per day than for someone who's a lab scientist and just working all the time in a lab. Now, this is interesting, but um, uh, one thing that you need to realize is that um, uh, that there's a um, uh, a challenge in applying this um, when gamma is too small. Now that, that may not sound obvious, but, but I'd remind you that if gamma is small, so this is k to the minus gamma. So as, as we increase gamma, um, excuse me, as we increase uh, gamma, um, p of k is going to drop off more quickly with k, right? If, if, if gamma is just 1, um, p of k is going to go down as 1 over k. Uh, p of k will be dropping off as 1 over k. If gamma is 2, then p of k is going to drop as the square of k. So it's going to drop more quickly, right? And I said this earlier. If, if k is, if gamma is 3, it's going to drop off as 1 over k cubed very, very quickly indeed. Um, so, and it reflects the fact that, you know, a one over k to the cubed is a lot smaller than one over k squared or one over, one over k, k, um, no pun intended. Um, so, um, it bears in mind that, um, if you, if you sum this up, after all, these are probabilities, um, we could sum them up and they should sum to one. Um, if we were to try to figure out what is that C factor that goes in front here, because we have P of K equals C times this. And I said C just makes it add up to one. So we're gonna choose C so that when we multiply it, all these sum up to one as we sum from, from K equals one to K equals infinity. Okay, um, and if you consider that, um, uh, what this is, it's it's uh, one over um, one over gamma minus one. What this is, what this means is the probability distribution, p of k. Okay, this should be instead of x, it should be k. Oh man, um, sorry about that. This should be gamma minus one times k to the minus gamma. That's the probability distribution. Now. That's that's nice in theory, except that this blows up if gamma is one. Like if gamma is one, it doesn't go down at all, right? Uh, uh, or it goes down very slowly, I should say. It goes as down as one over k, and it doesn't converge. 
Uh, this is something that um, uh, fellow student Jeff Foster posted something on um, some time ago, uh, very helpful. But um, basically, this sum doesn't add up to a finite thing if k is, if, sorry, gamma is, is one. It's only if gamma is greater than one that this actually adds up to a, a finite uh, value, okay? So gamma equal to one is too slow. There's no probability distribution where it goes down as, as uh, one over k to the one power. It's only once you get uh, gamma above one that it, that it can be a legitimate probability distribution. And now we're going to consider that probability distribution. Let's consider the variance of it, OK? And again, it, we have x sort of as a continuous stand-in for k. We're going to calculate this with integrals just because they, they're, they're an easy way to calculate uh, what these, these totals are approximately. And what you'll get is the mean is this. The, st the variance is this, OK? And this poses some challenges for us because the mean has a denominator of gamma minus two. And what that's saying is if the mean, if the gamma is two, um, you're not gonna actually have a, a mean number of, of contacts in the population um, uh, because basically it's gonna decrease too slowly. You're gonna have arbitrarily more people with higher numbers of connections and you're not gonna have an average number of contacts across the population, which is meaningful if gamma is two. You could have the people with lots and lots of contacts will be adding so many contacts to the mean that it won't even converge. It won't even have a legitimate mean. And the variance requires gamma, gamma greater than three um, to compute the variance. Otherwise the variance blows up. The, the variance across this, um, this distribution. Um, now, this may strike you as an interesting factoid. You know, you may say, well, okay, thank, thank you very much for telling me that. Um, but it turns out this is gonna have really big implications for what we're talking about next. And I'm gonna come back to it. Um, so we spoke earlier about the important the importance of heterogeneity. And I said, we're gonna have two goals here. One is to talk about the networks that account for these patterns. And we've seen scale-free networks exhibit this power law scaling where you have this long tail, a disproportionate number of individuals have very, very large number of connections, even though most have very few. And where you can get a, uh, a slower drop off um, uh, or a faster drop-off, depending on the value of gamma. Uh, those, those sort of uh, networks uh, exhibit this sort of power law scaling that leaves this signature in the form of a log log graph. If you internalize those points I've just uttered in the past minute, you'll be you know, pretty well prepared for future pop quizzes and in, in the final exam, I might, might note here. Um, but our query now is how do we modify classic equations associated with infection spread to account for heterogeneity? And partly on account of the time, um, I'm gonna have to give an abbreviated account for it, but this is gonna harken back to our, um, to our ODE coverage, our coverage of these infectious disease models using, um, using compartmental models, using system dynamics aggregate models. Now, you may think that's unusual because um, this is occurring in an agent-based module of the class. And indeed, one of the big motivations for agent-based models is to capture diverse network structures, including scale-free networks. Um, but it turns out we can get some insight, as with many spheres, by approximating these with ODEs and coming up with, with more sort of general um, formulas for how they affect dynamics. We can always simulate them with an agent-based model. And in fact, we do often with gusto, but um, uh, that 
shouldn't stop us from inquiring um, at a more broad qualitative level. It's, it's beyond quanti uh, qualitative, it's sort of quantitative. How do these affect dynamics? How do they affect the, um, the spread of infection in terms of things like the basic reproductive number? And it's for that purpose that we're gonna be looking at these with this lens, bearing in mind that really agent-based modeling is the very powerful tool. This individual-based characterization is the very powerful tool for investigating um, how to intervene in those networks, um, the details of network dynamics, et cetera. We're gonna be looking at a stylized representation and it will perhaps broaden your thinking about what we can represent with um, aggregate dynamic models. So we're hearkening back to an earlier time uh, many weeks ago where we had uh, SIR models. And we're gonna focus in on, on I here, the number of infectives. And you'll recall I dot is the rate of change, right? If it's, if it's 10, it means 10 more people are infected per unit time. If it's minus 10, 10 fewer people are infected per, uh, per unit time. Um, so I dot is the rate of change of, of the number of infectives. And we had this formula here, which was associated with this force of infection, C times I over N times beta, all times S. So C times I over N times beta is the chance per unit time a susceptible will get infected. And we multiply it by S and, and the I and S term reflect the fact that it was nonlinear. And then we had this I over D term that reflected recovery and D we're using as the mean duration of infection, okay? Um, now, um, what we're gonna do here, which again is gonna push your thinking perhaps of what you can do with these sort of models, we're gonna break the population up. So right now we have kind of a blunt characterization of susceptibles as a whole, infectives as a whole. They're just kind of this pool of susceptibles, pool of undifferentiated infectives. We're gonna break them up into groups. But we talked about this before with groups that are a little bit more classic, things like men and women or, or, or things like people who live in different cities, um, people of different ages. But here we're gonna divide these up according to their contact rate, okay? So, so there's gonna be things like uh, I sub zero, which are gonna be infectives who have contact with no one Per unit time, maybe they're in isolation. There's I sub one, people who have contact with one person per day, let's suppose on, on average. I sub two, be people who have contact with two people per day. Um, and similarly for susceptibles, there's, there's people who you know, have, have, have uh, almost shut-ins and they have no contact per day. There's people who have 10, 10 contacts per day, that'll be S sub 10. So we're kind of taking this undifferentiated pool of susceptibles that we normally have dealt with and we're parceling it out into these groups and an arbitrarily large number of them. So there's some S sub 100 and some S sub 1000 there. Um, uh, but the key point is they're distinguished by the number of contacts they have per unit time, okay? And, um, you know, at, at first blush, we, we might try to represent take advantage of dividing it up by taking this formula and dividing it up and say, okay, we're gonna have a formula for each value of K. Great. So we're gonna have I sub K and ask how I sub K is gonna evolve, okay? Um, uh, that's great. Um, so I sub Ks are gonna get infected and they're gonna recover. So the recovery is pretty clear. It's I sub K over D, great. Um, so if I sub K is hundred people, we're gonna have some fraction of them. You know, if I sub a hundred is, if, if, if there's a hundred people with 50 contacts per day, I sub 50, um, I sub 50 is equal to hundred, we'll have some number of those hundred recovering per day. But those, if we think about infection spread from those people, what, you know, these are, these are people with K contacts per day. So, so surely what used to be just C, just sort of this, this, this overall constant contact rate, we can 
we can take advantage of the fact we know, we actually know how many contacts they have per day. Um, uh, and we can reflect it in here. So this is like K per unit time, okay? Now, sometimes we use um, a different way of, of, of measuring this. Uh, uh, so sometimes we actually modify the value of beta to take this into account, but often beta is just uh, beta here because we have K being per unit time number of contacts, in which case we could just write K and, and regular beta here. Otherwise we, we could fold in a constant to beta, okay? Um, okay, so, so this was our C, but now it's our K, right? Um, we, we, we're capturing the fact people with K contacts are more likely to get infected because they have contacts with K people. And okay, those K people, how many people of the people they have contact with are infective? Well, you might be excused for thinking, okay, well, we look, we we parceled out all the people I into I sub zero, I sub one, I sub two, all these different groups by the number of contacts. We just add them up to get the number of infectives uh, over N. That's our fraction of infectives times beta. Um, and all of this then is the force of infection. But we're 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 not taking advantage of the situation. We're ignoring some important things. First of all, we're assuming that these K people, when they contact others, that those contacts are equally likely to occur with a person who has one contact themselves as a person who has 20 contacts for themselves or 100 contacts. I mean, surely this person may have K contacts. Oh my gosh, this should be I sub J. Oh man, this should be I sub J. Um, uh, um, okay, uh, that's that's really bad. This is um, this is I sub J. Okay, I, I can't resist this. I'm gonna go in and 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 fix it. Ignore the K. This is J there. Okay. Um, so this is I sub J, and um, this I sub J reflects the fact that we are totaling up the total number of infectives, but the people who have more contacts out there in the population will tend to mix more with us. Um, so more with someone with K connections will tend to mix more with someone with a larger number of connections themselves. Um, and these people with higher numbers of contacts, these I sub J for really large J are more likely to be infected as well. Okay, so um, so that's another thing that we're currently ignoring, and um, we're going to see if we can uh, remedy both of those in the coming minutes. There's a nice way to um, to to paint this with a background color. There it is. Okay, uh, let's just uh, okay. The K goes away. Um, uh, okay, or OJ, um, IJ. Um, okay. So let's uh, let's revise this formulation. Okay, um, here we're going to take into account what we just said. Um, we're going to take into account not the fraction of people that are infected, but the fraction of contacts that occur with infected people, with already infected people. So we're trying to figure out how many people in, with K contacts get infected, and what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll, we'll figure out each of these people with K contacts is mixing with K people per unit time. Those contacts per unit time are disproportionately with people who, who have large numbers of contacts. And one nice way to do it is ask, well, look, let's, let's talk about not the fraction of people in the population that are infected, but the fraction of all contacts occurring in the population that are occurring with infective people. So each of these people in the population, um, say these N sub J people in the population is having J contacts total. And some number of people in the population are, are infected already and, and, and I sub J will have J connections. And so this is the, the fraction up here of, the, um, of, the, of all connections which are occurring with people that are infected, okay? So these sums are over now, contacts occurring in the population.
And these are contacts with infectives in the numerator and contacts with in the denominator with anyone. Um, and so the quotient uh, uh, of this is the fraction of all contacts in the population that are made by infectives. So maybe this I sub K, this person, we're trying to figure out how many people with, uh, with K connections are going to get infected. How many of these S's are going to get infected? Well, they have contact with K total people. Of those contacts they have with K total people, these are the number that occur with infectives. These are the fraction that occur with infectives. And then we multiply by beta. Um, OK, so um, uh, here we have the uh, a correction which takes into account these factors. We're taking into account the people who are have higher number of connections, will have disproportionate um, likely to being mixed with, and, and they can have different uh, uh, rates of infection, prevalences of infection. And uh, we are taking into account that this person's, this susceptible's K connections are occurring disproportionately, or are occurring disproportionately with people with large numbers of connections. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Mindful of the time, I'm just going to uh, jump to the chase here. So it turns out that if you do this um, and you go through some algebra, which is fun to go through, uh, but I did it one weekend and, and it's a lot of fun. What you can get out is a formula that looks like this. And, and the basic idea is we're, we're, we're formulating this as kind of a rate of change of the force of infection here. Okay, um, and the force of infection um, uh, is changing um, uh, in a way that's described with, with this uh, equation. And um, this is basically reflective of uh, a, a factor that, that will say, you know, to what degree is the force of infection growing over time? If this is greater than one, um, uh, lambda dot, uh, excuse me, if it's greater than zero, lambda dot is going to be growing. If it's less than zero, lambda dot is going to be shrinking. It's going to be lambda dot is negative. Uh, if this thing is greater than zero, lambda dot is positive. So this is the force of infection, how quickly it's growing. And what you'll notice is that, that this is very similar to a classic SIR system with C, the contact rate looking like this. Um, this is, this is for the, the force of infection. And it turns out that the basic reproductive number, and I'm going over this quickly, but the basic reproductive number is essentially beta times this quotient, uh, which is an expected value of J squared divided by expected value of J times D. Now, that may look kind of blunt to you, but um, this is called the second moment, and this is the first moment. This is the mean. Um, and this is closely related to the variance, okay? Um, but the important thing is that um, it is uh, varying with uh, statistics given by the distribution over rates of contact, okay? And if we boil this down into terms you'll more fully, uh, you may, may recognize from, uh, one of your statistics or probability courses, um, what we get is the basic reproductive number is equal to beta times mu is the mean number of contacts a person has in the population. That's E of J, okay? The expected value of, of contacts. That's the, that's, how many contacts they have per unit time on average. That's your average person's contacts. In short, that used to be C. So it used to be we had beta, C, D. Um, we had, uh, that was the basic reproductive number. Beta was the chance that a given contact between an infective and a susceptible would transmit infective infection. Um, C was the, number of contacts per unit time on average in the population, that's now called mu here, and D was the duration of infection. But here we have this added term, which is the ratio of the variance to the mean, okay? Um, and 
no longer it says beta CD, it's, it's beta C plus this term. And what this is saying is variability matters, heterogeneity matters, disparities in contact matter. It's actually the variance uh, and its ratio with the mean that can also, also increase uh, the basic reproductive number. And this is disconcerting because it may mean that an infection would seem to die out if you didn't account for variability in contact, in fact, will stay present because the basic reproductive number is greater than one. It will stay present um, uh, even though you, you thought mu was too small. You, you thought it was you know, a small contact rate and that basic reproductive number will be less than one. No, because of this added factor that takes into account variability in contacts, not just the mean contact, it can actually stay, stay around. Um, okay. Um, now, uh, it turns out that, that this has really big implications um, when we have scale-free networks, because as you may recall, and if I had had presence of mind, I would have had the slide there. I rearranged the slides earlier. Um, variance only exists for gamma greater than three. Um, so this, this variance term, otherwise it's infinite. So if you have a scale-free network, with gamma less than three, um, in theory, you have a, if it's truly a scale-free network, you have an infinite basic reproductive number. Now, if that's not scary, I don't know what is. Now, realistically, there's limits, right? Um, uh, there, are, there are limits to how many connections people could have through packing, um, uh, through limits on human behavior. And uh, what this does mean though is, to the degree that our data on people's contact patterns is governed by basically scale-free laws, um, we need to really worry about not just the average person, but the people on those tails, the people way out here who have disproportionate numbers of connections. We don't have to just worry about your average population member in, in, in here in Saskatchewan with respect to spreading COVID. We have to worry about the super spreaders, the social butterflies, the people who, because of essential jobs, mix with lots and lots of other people. Those people could be the tail that wags the dog. Those people could uh, end up suffering disproportionately from COVID themselves and could spread it. And we have to protect them. And we have to have a system which is designed to try to find infection as quickly as possible and, and prevent the bug where possible from getting to them. So what this is saying big picture is that variability matters. The mean is not enough. And particularly when you're dealing with scale-free networks, dealing with your average case, you know, your average member, you're gonna, be, you're gonna be misleadingly thinking it's a mild situation, that the average person has very few contacts. It's the tail that wags the dog that will often dictate the behavior, like whether the bug survives. It's this variability. It's the fact that some people have way disproportionate number of connections that, that dominates and that will lead the infection to staying present instead of dying out. And indeed, we see this phenomenon in, in uh, quite a few infections where you would think it would die out based on the average number of connections because that doesn't get at the heart of the issue. The heart of the issue is these hubs. The heart of the issue is these people with, with disproportionate uh, connections who are often disadvantaged in life, often put in positions of victimization in life, um, not feel, for example, sex workers who can't go to the government uh, because they're, free, they're afraid of, uh, of deportation or of um, criminal penalties applied to them and, and that are forced into uh, to work conditions which require very large numbers of connections, for example, uh, connections way out here. It's often those people on the, on the, um, uh, who are at the margins of society that are at the core of the network um, and that have this disproportionate impact. And it's homeless individuals for COVID-19, people in prisons for COVID-19, people who are, who are um, uh, in, in, conditions where they can't afford to, uh, to take time off from, uh, 
from work uh, in multiple job working multiple jobs um, and and those who are um, placed in positions of disproportionate contacts despite their best wishes otherwise. Okay, um, so those are all the, the comments I'm going to offer uh, here on scale free networks. Um, the big picture here is heterogeneity matters. There's these power law scaling relationships. It can mean a disease can stay present where it would die out. Um, uh, there's this uh, phenomena of log log plots characterizing scale free networks and this long tail that we spoke of. Um, those are key points from this lecture to take away. I'm now going to comment on the, um, uh, the answers to the exam for anyone uh, who would like to stay for it. Um, so um, indicate the name of a network that reflects a combination of locally highly connected network and a globally connected network, small world network, okay? Um, uh, a ring lattice is purely locally connected. Um, a random network is globally connected. So is the scale free network. But the type we talked about, there was a mixture between the two, literally. Like 95% of my connections were local, 5% across the network is called a small world network. Okay? Um, and it reflects the fact that even with just a small proportion of those connections, I can have a um, situation which is not badly approximated by a random, um, a Poisson random network, random mixing. Um, What's, what does lock-in mean in the context of dynamic systems? Lock-in describes situations where, and I'll describe in a couple of ways, uh, uh, it's easy to avoid a state or easier to avoid a state early on, but once it's reached, once you get into that state, it requires much greater effort to escape from it. Situation where it's easier to prevent something than to remedy it. Um, um, you, through early investment of activation energy, you can escape it, but once you're sucked into it, um, you need a lot more energy to, to get out of it. There's a lot of situations in like, uh, like this in life, uh, cycles of poverty, cycles associated with addictions and, and substance use, um, cycles associated with um, um, lack of, uh, lack of um, taking advantage or being able to take advantage of educational opportunities that are, that are characteristic of this. There's lots of these lock-in phenomena. Um, uh, describe the function of calibration in the modeling process. Calibration is basically a process of trying to find plausible values or I'll accept ranges for parameters by matching, and this is the key thing, matching model output against empirical data or otherwise known facts. Uh, so basically you're estimating parameters by finding the best match, um, the, the parameters that allow the model to best match um, uh, observed uh, emergent behavior from, so between model emergent behavior and observed data from the world. Um, uh, true, false. Uh, suppose you have a person in agent-based model and any logic is description contains a state and a state chart that has a rate transition with a rate of one per day if the person leaving the state. Is it true that this person is guaranteed to leave the state within one day's time? The answer is no. It's a probability per unit time. It's not a probability. A probability of one will mean you're guaranteed to get out. It's a probability per unit time. What it does mean is that you will leave on one unit of time on average. Um, but there'll be some people leave before it. There'll be, but there'll also be many people leave after it. This is just a mean of one. And um, so uh, a rate transition will lead uh, to, uh, to some people leaving after it. Not everyone who leaves will leave before time one. If it were a timeout transition in any logic, that would be associated with a stiff um, um, uh, impulse distribution, a Dirac delta function that says everyone leaves at exactly one time unit. Um, but that's another matter. This is a rate transition. Okay. Important difference in system dynamics uh, between um, most system dynamics uh, models and agent-based models that affects sensitivity and calibration. Um, I had mind first and foremost, the presence of stochastics, these randomness over time, and both sensitivity and calibration need to take that into account at some level. But I'll accept some other answers. For example, much longer runtime with ABM models traditionally. Um, also uh, ABMs, 
traditionally have a greater number of parameters. There's more degrees of freedom, more moving parts as far as uh, changed assumptions. Um, I'll, you know, I'm inclined to be a, a little bit generous with that. Um, uh, okay, a uh, type of dynamic modeling when given a characterization of population, if you add a distinction between people, they're born in Canada or not, um, uh, what sort of modeling would be subject to a doubling of model space requirement and runtime requirement? The answer is aggregate system dynamics models. Um, and uh, the same answer applies actually to seven. Uh, aggregate system dynamics models or system dynamics, fine. Doesn't have to, you don't have to say aggregate if you don't, because um, it's the typical, it's a type of dynamic modeling in which doubling the size of the population will leave the model runtime essentially unchanged. So the soundbite here, the slogan, system dynamics models, um, invariant to population size, but they really um, scale poorly with uh, capturing heterogeneity differences. Asian-based models, um, uh, their runtime is directly and typically at least linearly impacted by population size, but they tend to be rather little impacted by heterogeneity in terms of runtime and, and space, uh, space requirements. So those are the answers to the questions. I'd be glad to answer questions about my answers um, during office hours in just a few minutes, but I hope that uh, review is useful. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, I was recording that too. Well, I, I suspect you may not uh, regret that in time for the final. Okay, uh, thanks very much.